Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, my name is Paweł Midemski. I'm director of the Polish Institute of International Affairs. And I have um, enormous pleasure to welcome uh, all our distinguished guests uh, gathered uh, here at uh, Peace and Premises as well as those um, following us on online. Um, and we are going to, uh, to talk today about very timely and topical issues of uh, strategic autonomy, strategic compass, defense, security uh, of, of uh, Europe. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome and introduce to you um, and also thank very much uh, Minister Konrad Szymański um, uh, for being with us, Deputy Secretary General for uh, European External Action Service, Charles Fries, um, Christy uh, Reich, um, Director of the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute at the International Center for Defense and, and Security, um, Daniel Fjord, Field uh, from the Institute, from EU Institute for Security uh, Studies, and Charles Powell um, from Elcano Institute, all uh, um, uh, present either here or virtually um, uh, will connect us. We still live in very difficult pandemic circumstances, so that's the only way how we can how we can organize uh, this kind of of. Uh, um, event. Uh, so we can do it on hybrid way, but I would like to thank uh, all participants for their time uh, and, uh, and the readiness to share their views uh, with uh, wider public in Poland and beyond. Um, um, EU ministers have recently discussed the first draft of strategic concept, and this is this is a proposal of wide-ranging package of reforms in the field of security and defense. The aim is to reinforce the capacity of the Union to stabilize its neighborhood and provide security for um, the member states. Some proposals um, raise concerns whether there is a complementary, enough complementary uh, between um, um, uh, NATO capabilities, NATO um, areas of responsibility, both political and, and military, um, and a new uh, genera generation of, of forces by the um, European Union. Should the EU create 5,000 strong new rapid reaction forces? Should the defense integration be run by a group of willing states? Or there is another concept um, by uh, existing uh, European Union institution, like a European Commission. But there is uh, much more to strategic autonomy than just the security dimension. We have a number of developments in the fields of trade, technology policy, for, in, for example, European Chips Act, Act EU efforts to control tech giants and dialogue with the United States in this field, developing ways to secure EU market from unfair investment practices, uh, mainly from China. In addition, Union is strengthening its position in hybrid threats, cooperating in the fields of uh, cyber security um, is also very high in the agenda. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, the proof of EU strategic autonomy concept is in the real world, whether it makes us Europeans stronger and uh, more um, allied to the, to the turbulent world. Let's make sure that strategic autonomy brings us closer to our Europe, um, um, more aware of security risks and more ready to face them. And this conference, I hope, will bring uh, us to a uh, better understanding where we are going, why we are doing so, and what actually is um, achievable um, among member states um, united by 
uh, I believe, uh, the need, the desire to preserve peace in Europe. So without further delay, I would like to pass the floor to Minister Konrad Szymański um, uh, with a hope that he will present us an official, official uh, stance of Polish government on the issue. Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you for this introductory remarks. And indeed, I would like to share with you some thoughts about uh, the way we, as Poland, are thinking about the strategy of autonomy in, in many uh, dimensions, at least two of them, strategic, security, and uh, economical, on the other hand. Uh, let me commence with uh, greetings for PISM, the Polish Institute of International Affairs, initiative to place such a, an important topic on its annual agenda as well as for inviting me for this conference. This event provides us with the perfect opportunity to discuss the concept of EU strategic autonomy in the political dimension with in-depth reflections how it will possibly affect our national policymaking activities. In September this year, within uh, the Chancellery of Prime Minister Office, we have organized a tailored conference putting a question whether the EU strategic autonomy concept will be the right response to rapidly changing the world. At that time, we have covered the economic context of autonomy within three interconnected themes, namely EU value chains and development perspectives for strategic sectors, international role of euro, and global benefits from the EU due to rivalry and shift of powers between US and China. Main conclusion has been very clear. Both spheres of EU strategic autonomy, political and economic ones, cannot exist one next to the other and in result be analyzed separately. The relationship is indisputable. Second, we have elaborated and published uh, our Polish non-paper on the concept itself, which uh, makes our thinking and uh, prioritization an integral part of major contributions and evaluations for the EU key uh, initiatives. We would like to see the EU strategic autonomy as a more comprehensive and responsive capability to future crises, protecting first of all the functioning of the internal market and firmly anchored within the broader transatlantic community and its values. The EU economic space was severely tested by supply and demand restrictions. The pandemic outbreak has exposed the necessity to reinforce the EU to disruptions, including the strategic supply chains and economic sectors, such as pharmaceuticals and semiconductors. Also taking into, into account regional industrial differentiation and state of technological preparedness of particular member states in front of challenges imposed by upcoming green and digital transition. Strengthening the competitiveness of the European Union's industry, addressing strategic dependencies, enhancing resilience of critical entities and security of network and information system, importance of cybersecurity aspects together with the EU strategic partnership in this field, EU global gateway strategy, EU screening mechanism as a protection against distortion in trade with third countries, EU international procurement instrument, promoting fair and equitable taxation across Europe, which is a very vital aspect and with a growing importance for our administration, diversification of energy resources and supplies. This is the exemplification of crucial economic elements and the Polish contribution to the EU strategic autonomous picture. The EU needs to reveal its full potential as a global player. This ambition has been part of the EU legacy for many years and is visible in the treaties. 
We are aware that building EU strategic autonomy may generate economic tensions in the EU's external relations with third countries. EU digital autonomy is a very good example of such a possible tensions where we need more synergies with our closest partners. That is why our ambition would be to promote the idea as a helping to reinvigorate the transatlantic bond, reinforce EU-US mutual resilience and enable to tackle common challenges. The transatlantic cooperation remains a cornerstone in shaping multilateral and rules-based international order. In our opinion, there is no contradiction in keeping a strong transatlantic bond and reinforcing the EU as a global partner. We need to work with the United States in a tandem globally uh, as it is presented quite recently by declaration after the EU-US summit uh, this summer in Brussels. We need to build common transatlantic democratic and strategic culture, influence and even set global standards, especially in the digital world, promote multilateralism, including organizations belonging to the UN system. We need to counteract threats in cyberspace and build common positions around sanctioning those who transgress international norms. We need to cooperate on climate, talk together on Russia, and promote democracy, especially in Eastern European neighborhood. Happily, we see a revival of EU-US relations and the instrumentarium of soft cooperation that we see between the EU and Washington is really impressive. But substance should follow the main rhetorical shift or change. Poland is cautious uh, when addressing EU strategic autonomy in security and defense. We agree that Europeans should take up a bigger burden in maintaining their own security level. To work out a common understanding of security threats and to develop necessary capabilities. Well-funded defense cooperation among EU member states should strengthen not only EU's effectiveness and responsiveness, but also improve capabilities development and boost defense industry cooperation built on genuine collaboration and inclusiveness across European Union. It should also benefit collective defense in NATO. In CSDP, it is important to strengthen the EU contribution to building defense capabilities without compromising the role of NATO, which remains a cornerstone uh, for our common defense. It is necessary to develop the EU-NATO dialogue, reinforce the capacities of European technological and defense potential, as well as the initiatives aiming at developing defense and crisis management capabilities, such as PESCO. In that vein, we perceive uh, aims of uh, the EU strategic compass, which possibly will be adopted during the EU French presidency in 2022. As for the more robust EU stance in its close neighborhood, we basically have all the instruments in place. The enlargement policy for countries willing and able to accept EU standards is still available. There are also instruments of enhanced cooperation like European Neighbourhood Policy and Eastern Partnership. For the enlargement policy, our ambition is to make a realistic progress, especially with two countries, Albania and North Macedonia, which we hope will open the accession negotiations optimally this year. Another important country of Western Balkans is Serbia, with a significant influence in the whole region. We also hope the opening of the first cluster with Serbia will be possible in 2021. For the Western Balkans countries, the EU is a primary political and economic partner, so I believe they can only profit from strategic autonomy concept. For instance, 
shortening of value chains in certain products can boost trade between EU and Western Balkans, also reducing uh, dependence of EU on imports of pharmaceuticals uh, can boost economic possibilities in some Eastern partnership countries like Ukraine. Western Balkans are also a good example that EU needs to work in tandem with the US and other like migrant countries like United Kingdom. Crises we faced so far are becoming more complex and cross-border. It is evident that the increase in global economic rivalry constitutes a forage for political disputes. In other words, more often it replaces an aggregated armed conflict. In the future, the EU must be prepared to experience severe crises of hybrid nature, with presumably cascading effects. To conclude, we need to calibrate or recalibrate our trade relations to reduce our vulnerabilities and dependencies in critical sectors of economy. Pandemia gives us no choice. Europe should do more on our security as a contributor and strong partner in transatlantic community to mutually reinforce our security needs across the globe. Deterioration of our security situation gives us no alternative. Proactive attitude towards building the EU strategic autonomy requires risk anticipation and mitigation strategies across different sectors in both political and economic understanding. Therefore, we have to request involvement on the side of think tanks, like Polish Institute of International Affairs, using their uh, expertise, prognostic experiences, and broad research portfolio for putting uh, and developing the EU strategic autonomy concept in a way allowing to advocate the vital Polish postulates and interests. I really count on such a cooperation and assistance uh, and treat this particular event like a solid basis for intensification of close working cooperation. Thank you for your attention and I wish you a conference full of inspiring ideas, contacts and uh, breakthroughs. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and uh, also I appreciate um, um, your words of encouragement uh, addressed to the Polish Institute of National Affairs. Now I would like to uh, uh, invite um, um, Charles Fries, uh, Deputy Secretary General for European External Action Service, uh, behind this, uh, uh, to, to take us all behind this uh, uh, microphone and share with us um, the main uh, provisions of, uh, of a draft, first draft of strategic uh, um, a concept. Uh, both uh, speakers has kindly, have kindly agreed to take some um, a few urgent questions if they are. So uh, if you have uh, something to, to ask, uh, don't shy away uh, and prepare your questions. Um, um, sir, the floor is yours. Minister, Director, ladies and gentlemen, first allow me to thank the Polish Institute of International Affairs for hosting this very timely conference. Two weeks ago, the High Representative, Joseph Borrell, presented the draft of the strategic compass to defense and foreign ministers of the 27 EU member states. As we are entering discussions on this proposal in Brussels, it was very important for me to visit Warsaw, to engage with Polish authorities and Polish audience and to listen to their views and suggestions on this very important process. And so that's why this conference perfectly matches this agenda and I'm very pleased to come back to Warsaw here today. I would like to make four points this morning. First point, 
I would like to acknowledge Poland's contribution to the EU security and defense agenda. Poland is not only a strong NATO ally and one of EU's top military spenders, it is traditionally a strong supporter of CSDP. In words, and more importantly, in deeds. Here, I would like to recall, first, Poland's contributions to CSDP missions and operations, from hundreds of soldiers in U4 Chad in 2008, to the deployment of Polish police in Ulex Kosovo, support to Operation Altea in Bosnia-Herzegovina, or a surveillance plane for Operation Irini in the Central Mediterranean. Second, Poland's support to EU defense initiatives, such as the European Defense Fund or the Permanent Structured Cooperation, PESCO. You mentioned that, Minister, in your speech. And PESCO across all domains, training, land, maritime, air, cyber, space, joint enablers. And as we are striving to make full use of the potential of the PESCO, it's crucial to be as ambitious as possible, and we count on Poland's continuous commitment to that end. Third illustration of the strong support of Poland to CSDP, it's a support for an ambitious approach to new challenges, such as hybrid and cyber, and also to the emergence of a top-class EU defense technological and industrial base. And finally, of course, I have in mind Poland's firm support for a strengthened EU-NATO cooperation. So against this background, it's not a surprise for me if Poland's contribution to the strategic compass has been very much valued in Brussels. My second remark is why do we need a European compass now? Obviously, we are not starting from scratch in the security and defense domain. Since 2003, almost 40 civilian and military CSDP missions were launched across the world, from Timor to Gaza, from Afghanistan to the Republic of Congo. The creation of the defense, European Defense Agency in 2004, or the establishment of EU battle groups in 2007, were other important steps forward. But since 2016, we have witnessed considerable progress in the security and defense domain. This includes the European Defense Fund, the permanent structure cooperation, but also the establishment of a new military planning and conduct capability for our training missions, the MPCC. And the most recent instrument is a, re is a European peace facility. So all these efforts were motivated by the shared understanding that our geopolitical environment is rapidly deteriorating. Europe is in danger, facing old and new threats that are not just military or territorial. For example, the use of hybrid tactics, cyber attacks, and disinformation are part of the reality in dealing today with Russia, in addition to its military buildup at the border with Ukraine. Europe cannot afford to be a bystander in a more and more dangerous and competitive world. European citizens themselves want the EU to protect them, to protect them more. When Poland is facing the Lukashenko regime's hybrid attack on its eastern border and the large-scale instrumentalization of irregular migration flows, it's not enough to express solidarity Concrete support and concrete actions are needed. And this is what the EU is for. The EU is acting at exceptional speed on four tracks. Humanitarian support through international organizations, diplomatic outreach to the countries of transit or origin, sanctions, and border management. The EU stands together with Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia on this matter, and we will never tolerate such hybrid attacks. All those threats and challenges make it also urgent and necessary to shift gear and set new concrete goals and objectives at the horizon of 2030. 
This is the rational, the raison d'être of the compass. My third remark is what are the, third, the, the key elements of the High Representative's proposal? As a starting point, this document outlines the key patterns of the world we face. Global risks like weakening multilateralism, terrorism, the impact of climate change, migration, but also the return to power politics, rising bipolarity between the United States and China, Russia's attempt to widen its geopolitical sphere of influence, rising instability in our neighborhood, in the East and in the South, all tensions accompanied by a battle of narratives, disruptive technologies, cyber attacks, or disinformation operations. Against this backdrop, the High Representative proposes a set of very concrete actions. First, to strengthen our ability to act more rapidly, more robustly, and with more flexibility. And that's why the High Representative Borrell proposed to take decisions faster and, be, and to be more agile. For example, by allowing a group of willing and able member states to plan and conduct an operation under the EU flag once it has been agreed unanimously. And we want to exploit the full potential of the Article 44 of the treaty in this context. Second illustration, we would like to strengthen our common command and control structures and create incentives to improve the fourth generation for our missions and operations. The proposal here is not to develop new structures, not to develop new structures, but to make full use of existing ones, including the MPCC. A third illustration, we want to develop an EU rapid deployment capacity, not a force, dear Mr. Director, a capacity, it's a little bit different. EU rapid deployment capacity that will allow the EU to swiftly deploy a modular force of up to 5,000 troops, including land, air, and maritime components. To reach this objective, and I would like to insist on that, we could follow a phased and pragmatic approach. We will start with the formulation of concrete scenarios by the end of 2022, such as a, as a rescue and evacuation operation or a stabilization mission in hostile environment. Then, starting, that's our proposal, starting from 2023, organizing live exercises on that basis within the EU framework and with EU financial support. We could use existing CSDP instruments, such as the EU battle groups, whose parameters will have to be substantially modified because EU battle groups exist since 2007, but they have never been deployed. So we have to change the parameters in order to, be, to make them more effective. And my last point, very important, we should also develop the necessary strategic enablers to fulfill those tasks, such as strategic transport, force protection, drones, or cyber defense capabilities. With those assets, the EU rapid deployment capacity could be functional by 2025. So, Minister, Mr. Mr. Director, when you insist on capabilities, we are fully on your line. We want, we think that the solution for a, more strong, a stronger European defence is to develop, indeed, capabilities. A second objective for the High Representative is to protect our citizens. And that's why he proposed to develop an EU hybrid toolbox in order to respond to the wide range of hybrid threats we are confronted with. This toolbox would cover our response to cyber attacks. And I would like to recall that eight individuals and four entities from Russia, China, and North Korea are already listed under the EU cyber sanctions regime. This toolbox would also address foreign information manipulation, targeting, for instance, electoral process in the EU, as well as our actions abroad, as we saw from recent disinformation campaigns against our military missions in the Central African Republic. We also need to secure European access to strategic domains, such as space, cyber, high seas, against the maneuvers of our strategic competitors. For this, we will further develop the EU cyber defense policy 
and adopt for the first time an EU space strategy for security and defense. And we will expand our coordinated maritime presence, for instance, in the Indo-Pacific early next year. We need also to invest more and better in capabilities and innovative technologies. Here, the proposal is to do more to fill the gaps on critical enablers such as airlift transport, air refueling, helicopters, intelligent surveillance reconnaissance. Building on the first CARD report presented one year ago, the COMPASS mentioned specific EU flagship projects, projects such as naval unmanned platforms, future combat air systems, platforms for space-based Earth observation, and main battle tanks. The EU's defense initiatives from CARD, PESCO to EDF will help reduce the gap, will help reduce the gap, but we need to go even farther. The COMPASS should help the EU remain at the cutting edge of technological innovation and further reduce its vulnerabilities and dependencies. And that's, you insisted on that, uh, Minister, in your speech. Today, 8% of the resources allocated to the European Defence Fund are already dedicated to programmes related to disruptive technologies. It offers great potential for small and medium enterprises all across the EU, including, of course, in Poland. The Commission's forthcoming roadmap on critical technologies will be particularly important to reduce our strategic dependencies. Obviously, I would like to insist on that, the objective here is not to develop EU capabilities, but capabilities that remain in the hands of member states. And so these capabilities that we want to develop will, can be also used in a NATO context because we are very much attached to the principle of single set of forces. Let me stress it again, all EU defence initiatives have been designed with this principle in mind, the principle of single set of forces, in order precisely to avoid any risk of duplications. More than that, coherence of output with NDPP priorities is one of the selection criteria used to identify PESCO projects. As a result, almost all 60 60 PESCO projects respond to NATO defence planning priorities. So I want to insist on this. What we are doing in the EU is fully consistent with, with NATO priorities. And what the EU is doing is, is so in full coherence and interoperability with NATO because we are convinced that a stronger EU in defence goes hand in hand with a stronger NATO. This leads me to my fourth and final point. The EU needs partners, starting with NATO. The COMPASS will outline concrete steps for advancing our cooperation with NATO at all levels. Political dialogue, crisis management, military mobility, hybrid threats. This commitment to reinforcing the transatlantic bond and ways to achieve it will be spelled out in a new joint declaration to be adopted as soon as possible between the EU and NATO. This joint declaration will provide guidance for cooperation in new areas, such as emerging and disruptive technologies, resilience, climate and defense, space. We also aim to deepen our relationship with the United States, in particular by launching very soon a dedicated security and defense dialogue as it was agreed at the EU-US summit last June. Now that the European Defence Agency Steering Board approved a, negotiating, a negotiation mandate, we are also looking forward to the formal launch of negotiations on an administrative arrangement between the EDA, the European Defence Agency, and the US Department of Defence. This shows clearly that when EU member states invest and cooperate more in defence, they do it for themselves as Europeans, but they also do it as an investment in better cooperation and a more balanced burden sharing. I want to insist on this. It's very important because when we reinforce our capacity to act autonomously and when we strengthen at the same time our relations with partners, we consider that 
it's really the two sides of the same coin. The coin is Europe's security. So reinforcing our capacity to act autonomously and strengthening our relations with partners, in particular NATO, is really for us the way we have to follow. To conclude, I presented you today some of the proposals that we have discussed at length over the last few months. Without doubt, a lot of work will be required in the coming weeks to fine-tune and forge a solid consensus behind them. The objective is to submit the final compass to the foreign and defense ministers for adoption on the 21st of March 2022, and then uh, to have this document endorsed by our leaders at the European Council on the 24th of March. Eventually, the success of this process lies in the hands of member states, all of them. That's why we count on the, continu on the, continued, on the continued active and constructive participation of Poland in this process. Later today, I will have more detailed discussions on this with my counterparts from both the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Defense. I really consider, and we really consider in Brussels, that Poland's input and leadership in the development of the key elements of the strategic compass is crucial. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Director Freyth. Um, uh, now there will be there will be uh, an opportunity to um, uh, to ask a few questions. I, I see um, two people are um, already signaling uh, the willingness to to take the floor and ask questions. Um, um, I will um, uh, before I give them the floor. I would like to uh, just uh, share my uh, immediate reaction after two, two introductory um, uh, speeches. Uh, so I'm not going to, to add yet additional uh, speech on the matter, but just to comment what we have heard um, um, a few moments ago from both uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, first, my reaction is that I um, hear a lot of optimistic, um, complementary with each other uh, remarks. Optimistic, because uh, both speeches are a signal that we are sailing, at least intellectually, in, 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 at least in, in, the, in the line of thinking, in the same direction. Uh, there is a growing awareness, um, uh, already uh, also seen in, in this introductory remarks of our um, principal speakers, there's growing awareness that uh, we cannot uh, engage ourselves yet again in a never-ending debate about structures, about um, the vision of, of uh, influence and power in the process of thinking about uh, security. There is also growing awareness that we don't have much time left. Um, and either we um, uh, take uh, uh, the issue of, of peace in Europe seriously, uh, and uh, either we generate additional potential, or uh, we simply invite troubles. We invite troubles for all, all Europeans, and we, we invite troubles for peace in Europe. Um, there is, I think, a uh, um, shared view that uh, there are uh, at least three uh, aspects which drive our uh, uh, thinking about boosting uh, European defense potential now. First, uh, uh, the question which organizes uh, our thinking. Can we defend Europe? Uh, can we defend Europe alone? I mean, without a um, uh, huge American contribution to um, maintaining peace in Europe? That's the, the question which has uh, not been asked for years for very simple 
reason. The United States were, uh, and you know, still is, a European power, heavily uh, engaged in protecting uh, peace and defending peace in, in Europe. And there was no uh, imminent threat to peace in Europe, um, which could um, uh, simply be uh, provide a reason for uh, European nations to invest more. But we have been hearing from Washington uh, DC for decades. Uh, we Europeans do more. Uh, your share in defending peace in Europe is not enough. Um, it's not about Trump. It started from George W. Bush, then continued by Obama administration, then Trump. We have been hearing, we have been hearing the same message from the Biden administration. Uh, the context, the strategic context is however now um, different and I would say even urgent because now uh, uh, China openly expressed its uh, um, aspiration uh, to uh, compete with the United States for global hegemony. China openly uh, uh, says that its aspiration is to um, overrun the United States in terms of defense capabilities. Uh, China wants to have a bigger navy than the United States, bigger uh, uh, nuclear potential. And of course, if you hear uh, um, uh, American decision makers and analysts now, they say that China would be um, a problem number one to tackle for American administration. Uh, now we hear that Russia is also uh, thinking about reshaping the post-Cold War order in Europe. Uh, Russia communicates its aspirations uh, in this regard publicly. If we take that, you know, just uh, in recent days, uh, American administration informed uh, uh, its European allies, that Russia may be considering a war to achieve, in, a war in Europe to achieve this end. Um, it also contributes to the overall awareness of urgency of the, thing, of the issues we are uh, uh, talking today. Um, so um, uh, this conference, about uh, a strategic compass, strategic thinking in Europe is, as you can see, um, um, very timely. And I hope that we would be able to provide, to add to this discussion, our uh, um, own intellectual input uh, as an analyst, as an expert, and I believe as a Europeans interested in preserving peace in Europe. Um, and I stop here. Now I would like, I, I see uh, uh, three people uh, wanting to uh, ask questions. So, uh, uh, Dr. Joanna uh, Szymańska. Uh, good morning, Jolanta Szymańska. I'm head of the European Union uh, program uh, here at PISM. I would like to ask a question to Minister Szymański. You mentioned in your um, introduction uh, in the speech that uh, Poland perceives uh, this concept of strategic autonomy um, in a comprehensive way. Um, I have an impression that uh, Poland puts a special emphasis on this economic dimension of strategic autonomy. And uh, that's why I want to ask uh, where in, in which fields do you see the uh, biggest potential for um, uh, development of this strategic autonomy, uh, where potentially we can find consensus with our partners and where potentially we can disagree with partners uh, in, in Europe. Thank you. Are there any questions to Minister Szubański? Please. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Przemysław Biskup. I'm, uh, I'm analyst here at PISM, and I wanted to ask uh, uh, Minister Szymanski, but also indirectly uh, Mr. Fries, uh, about the future 
in the light of what they said uh, about the future of uh, EU UK cooperation. I mean, UK at the moment is still very prominent member of NATO, uh, and um, it, until recently it was uh, it was a EU member. Uh, unfortunately, we, we had this uh, Brexit process. And it seems that uh, uh, there is still the fallout of, of the Brexit process. We can see it, for example, in case of uh, Northern Ireland uh, negotiations, but also in the shape of uh, uh, cr migrant crisis in the channel. But uh, at the same time, it, it, the UK has been providing and is still providing uh, a lot of uh, critical capabilities, uh, for example, uh, strategic airlift. So m my question would be, what is the future uh, for that cooperation and what is the feasibility of keeping the UK as, a, as an important and engaged partner? And uh, what is the probability of uh, making uh, EU-UK uh, security and foreign relations uh, agreement because it hasn't been uh, included into Brexit, uh, Brexit set of agreements? Thank you. Thank you for those two questions. They deserve to uh, be answered by another two uh, long lectures, but I will try to conclude in a, in a more concise way. On Brexit, we used to believe that the Brexit process, whatever we think about this process, the sovereign decision of UK, one day will bring us an opportunity to rebuild, to reconstruct the new architecture of our relations between the EU and UK. We are concerned that it, uh, it doesn't happen, uh, that we still face problems, that we still face a quite high risk of potential damage. Uh, even after the ratification of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, we see that the risks are still there. So, we, of course, we have to be patient as the EU. Uh, we have to remember that whatever will happen and whatever we hear in UK, we have to be ready to reconstruct this cooperation, not only in terms of trade, which is of course a vital but easier part of the game, but also uh, based on one day po positive outcome of this negotiation process and positive Im good implementation of TCA, we will be able to build more political uh, mutual understanding uh, to reconstruct um, the, the, the the way we cooperate with UK in security and strategic aspect. It is necessary. Europe uh, can't uh, project its uh, power, can't project its future without uh, a clear vision of cooperation with UK. UK, as it is declared by many prime ministers, left EU but uh, can't, even can't left Europe. So when we are talking about security, we have to have in mind that whatever crisis we are facing, we should remember that we have to find a way how to cooperate uh, swiftly, efficiently with UK as a major contributor to international order. On, uh, on autonomy, I think uh, it's, it's a matter of, uh, of perspective. Of course, today, after pandemia, uh, I hope after pandemia, uh, and with recovery uh, already started, we are very much concentrated what we can do uh, to preemptively um, build an, an answer for the future crisis. Because we, we, we have to ag agree that the future crisis like this, with, maybe with a different nature, a little bit different nature, but the massive crisis could happen. So of course we have to draw all lessons from pandemia of 2019-20 and we are, we are very active here. And we believe that the thinking about new industrial policy, new trade policy, should be at the very center of our thinking about autonomy, because Europe, of course, will be a, a trading nation as a bloc. Europe uh, uh, can't change uh, this, because we are uh, beneficiaries of international trade to the degree which is probably not well understood by Europeans, because we don't know how the world, world would, would look like without free trade. Uh, of course, but we need uh, to think about recalibration in some aspects of our economic cooperation where, where it is um, risky. And we, we experienced this sort of, of risks and we experienced quite um, un, unhealthy, uncomfortable dependencies 
in, in especially in the medical uh, aspect, but in recovery, when we are talking about recovery, we will experience even, even deeper dependencies on um, new technologies, digital and, and, and so on. So we have to do something with this. It doesn't mean that we don't pay attention, equal attention to security aspect, but security aspect is well defined because we are talking about it not only for, for the last four or five years, uh, but much, much longer. And here our position is, is very clear. We believe that we could do more on security as Europe under the European flag, uh, but uh, autonomy is not a value in itself. The autonomy or bigger exposition of power by Europe is a value as a part of much broader picture where security interests are, are common for the whole so-called West. I like this term because it's widest possible de denomination, uh, and it, I think it's, it's very relevant when we are talking about global situation, our global security, to think about the West, not just European Union, uh, NATO, or some corners of those organizations, because the threats are bigger. And uh, trying at least to, an to, to answer to the question posed by Director Dembski, of course, Europe can't defend. Uh, by, by, by itself. When we see the situation last 15 years, just after enlargement, it is, it's, I think in, in Warsaw it's a good reference point, uh, we can see that even with limited uh, presence of United States, we can't stop the process of deterioration of security situation around our borders. And the security situation around our borders is bad and worse last 15 years. We see the deterioration of the situation almost everywhere. Failed states, hybrid destabilization, open wars, almost everywhere. So we have to think uh, with, a, with an open mind uh, about uh, how to respond to the situation. And we want to invest. We don't want only to criticize uh, some tones we see or you know, we hear in some capitals, brain dead and so on. We don't like this language, of course, but we can understand that this is not the language of Brussels, because the language of Brussels is composed with also Polish contribution, as it was mentioned by Deputy Secretary today. So we want to invest, we want to participate to, to build a, a denominator which would be good added value for, for European uh, security. So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to hear uh, that the synergy between contribution from the EEAS and the Polish Chancellor of Prime Minister is so synergetic. I think we can build on it. Thank you. And uh, uh, now there is a room for two questions to, to Charles Fries. And uh, uh, I will have one, and Mukash uh, Kulesa. Uh, and uh, are there online questions as well? Okay, so uh, let, let's, let's take uh, an online question from uh, Dr. Maciej Tel Marcin Telikowski. Marcin? He's freezed, probably. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Łukasz Kulesa. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm deputy head of research here at the, at the Institute and uh, questions on, on strategic compass to, to Dr. Fries. And this time we were lucky as external experts to read the draft almost at the same time as the member states. I'm not sure who to help, to, who, who to thank for that, but it, it just... <laughs> It just happens. Sometimes leaks are, are good for uh, for us. Therefore, we could we will also be able to to see the progress from the draft to the to the final product. Uh, so we will also see how the uh, politics as sausages are, are made internally. Uh, but it also means that the, the the first draft I think has opened itself to a number of review and criticism uh, from from the external parties. Uh, and so some of these uh, focused on one particular aspect, uh, especially on the, the rapid deployment 
uh, proposals. So I'm happy that, that today you discussed the, the draft in full. Uh, and I think it's very important to take into account the broad package of proposals which, which, which are there. Uh, and most of them are, are really pushing us in the very good uh, direction. Um, and personally, I would have uh, some issues with the language on the, on the threat assessment, uh, because I'm not sure what was in the classified version, uh, but this uh, page, uh, two thirds of the page, uh, if you look at Russia, if you look at China, at least for me, it required some effort to find them uh, in, in this draft and the, the language on Russia uh, as a challenge slash threat uh, seemed a, a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, fuzzy, but probably something to take as a, a constructive criticism. On the issue on the rapid deployment forces, uh, I mean, the question is for me uh, about the national force generation capacity and also uh, other requirements for the same forces, uh, which are also for the, for the countries which are also NATO members. Uh, for example, uh, NATO response force, uh, VJTF, uh, other forward deployments. Uh, so in a sense, uh, how certain are you that actually the member states uh, would commit their forces uh, in a way that would make it a viable concept? Uh, and not basically say that it's all nice in, in theory, uh, but in practice we have, let's say, VJTF uh, rotation coming up in 2025, and therefore uh, we, we cannot uh, commit to the, to the EU uh, capabilities. Um, and the third question, the third issue, uh, which you didn't discuss, but I think it's very important, uh, the review mechanism. And if I may call it... Uh, an enforcement mechanism or soft enforcement mechanism, because a lot of skeptics are there uh, who are saying that we heard this before. Uh, we heard the promises uh, and we heard the headline goals, uh, and then the member states themselves didn't really deliver. Uh, so this time was the review mechanism, uh, is the annual report uh, enough uh, wouldn't be possible to have something more in terms of naming and shaming, perhaps, uh, of the member states who are not living up to their uh, uh, commitment, especially that lots of these commitments were actually in mark for 22 and 23, which is just around the corner. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's let's try uh, to uh, uh, to get um, a question from Marcin Terlikowski. Marcin. I'm here. Good morning. Uh, I'll be quick and following uh, what Lukas asked you, uh, uh, Secretary Fries. Uh, basically, the issue of exercises uh, and the required command and control structure. This is again where we hear reassuring language about complementarity with what NATO is doing. But as you uh, know for sure, the uh, roster, the, the calendar for exercises in NATO and national exercises is full. And adding a new layer. Uh, EU exercises for an EU exclusive scenarios may again uh, introduce some, let's say, chaos to uh, to national uh, planning as regards uh, operational use of, uh, of forces to be used for exercise, but also for missions. So basically, again, following what, what Lukasz asked, how to uh, reconcile, how to assure this complementarity with NATO in practice, if, for instance, in the case of exercises, I think this is important, we have parallel and coordinated EU-NATO exercises, but we can't have, for obvious reasons, joint exercises. So an option to have EU military exercises as a part of a NATO exercise or a NATO link exercise would be very difficult to achieve. Uh, the same for the uh, command and control capabilities. The idea presented in the compass that the MPCC, the military planning um, uh, command uh, and conduct uh, capability will, will grow into some kind of operational headquarters is again uh, surfacing in the compass, but we know that we haven't found yet consensus in, uh, in European Union to have EU OHQ for, for the reasons of, of that, that it basically will uh, draw some resources from NATO structures, which we still are trying to uh, to feel the, the, the Ulm headquarters or the North Atlantic headquarters. So 
uh, again, uh, how to in practice develop the solutions which will mechanism which will assure the complementarity, which is a uh, principle which is reassuring, but I'm afraid can be difficult to be implemented in practice. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and I will add uh, my last my own qu question to uh, Charles Fries about this um, in-house secret, how you are doing these sausages. Um, so um, 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 I would like to to uh, to recall uh, Lord Lobertson, then um, General Secretary of NATO who 20 years ago said that NATO should go out of area or out of business. Uh, one may say that now Europe uh, is facing a similar dilemma. Um, either um, territorial defense or out of business. So uh, my question to you would be how to reconcile um, aspirations of member states regarding missions uh, um, definitely, there, there are a group of, of member states which are uh, more willing to generate expeditionary forces and these capabilities to uh, react rapidly on, on uh, security crisis uh, around Europe. And there are those who are much more focused on, on territorial defense. Uh, and they are enhanced by, by also the messages from the United States, who say that NATO, they say now that NATO should focus more on territorial defense, less on um, expeditions. So how you um, uh, reconcile these two very different uh, approaches? Thank you. Thank you very much for all these questions. First, um, uh, I would like to go back to the previous question about can, um, can we defend Europe alone? Uh, it must be clear that territorial defense, collective defense, it's for NATO. And the compass doesn't change anything to this fundamental principle. And we are ready to put it again in the draft. And we have already put it uh, clearly, uh, Europe wants to be a stronger security provider, wants to be stronger for the crisis management, precisely for the situations you've just mentioned, uh, uh, Mr. Director, that means to be able to project itself for some cases, for some crises where NATO doesn't want to intervene, where the US don't want NATO to be involved. And so that's why we always say that we want to be a better uh, security actor with partners each time it's possible, but we need also to be able to act autonomously if it's, it is in our interest and if so, some partners are not ready to join us. So we, what we would like is to have more freedom of action. Once again, each time as possible with partners, but if necessary, alone. But we don't change anything to the fact that collective defense, territorial defense, if Europe is at, if one member state is attacked, that would be for NATO. And I would like, of course, to recall that 21 member states out of 27 are also members of NATO. So we'd, we would not change this. Uh, for the UK, um, uh, as a minister, we deeply regret the fact that we are not able in the present circumstances to do more with the UK in CSDP, uh, I mean, uh, to have a partnership. Uh, we wanted to do that with the TCA, it didn't work, but we are still open for a strong partnership with the UK, and so the, the ball is clearly in the court of the UK, and we are waiting for their response. On the EU rapid deployment capacity, first, we used the word capacity and not EU rapid deployment force. Why? Because if we had said EU rapid deployment force, people would have thought, ah, the EU is creating a new standby force. And we heard the Polish concerns and the fact that many member states don't want the creation of a new standby force. So we prefer to, to use the word cons capacity. Why? Because for us, we need, what we need is to work on the parameters, on the conditions which will allow the deployment of a force. We don't want to create ab initio a force, ex ante. 
We want the force to be the outcome of a process. That's why we start with the scenarios. That's why we put emphasis on the exercises. That's why, and it's a key point, we, we, we put emphasis on the critical enablers, strategic airlift, drone, cyber assets, etc. That's why we said that for the C2, we have to be clear, this EU rapid deployment capacity will probably in the first years be used under a national OHQ and not with the MPCC. We are realistic. We are not going to, to create, we don't want to create a new shape in Brussels uh, with, uh, with hundreds and hundreds of uh, military. We know that it's not realistic. Uh, we want also to put the question of the financial solidarity with the common cost. If we want to deploy more forces, we need to see if it's possible to ex expand a little bit the scope the definition of common cost. And finally, we need also to work on the decision-making process. And that's why I mentioned in my speech the Article 44. We know that the unanimity, of course, is key. We don't want to change the unanimity. I, have to be clear, I want to be clear. But we want, in the framework of unanimity, we want to introduce more flexibility. That means if there is a decision taken by the 27 but if many member states don't want to be themselves involved, we would like a group of willing, a group, a coalition of the willing to be able to do something on behalf of the EU, but without being blocked at all levels by a unanimous uh, agreement. So I think it's important. Uh, Germany uh, presented a paper, very interesting paper, uh, with the support of uh, ne Netherlands, uh, Finland, Slovenia, um, Portugal. And we would like to, to see if we can introduce a little bit uh, uh, to, to be more agile. So. Um, uh, so our reasoning, it's, it's not the force that determines the mission, it's the mission that determines the force. So the, the, the constitution of the force will be the outcome. And that's why also we said that we need uh, to work on the reform of the battle groups, first point. And second, we need to ask member states if they are ready to uh, identify some modular forces that they could give, that they could offer, for certain operations or certain missions. So that, that would be a long process. We, we, we put the horizon, we set the horizon of 2025 for this EU rapid deployment capacity. That's rather realistic. We didn't say that this capacity has to be ready for end of 22. We know that it would be a, a dream and, a, and, a, and, and crazy. So we really want to move step by step pragmatic way, and I, I hope that Poland had understood the logic of our proposal to go step by step and to try to take, to draw the lessons of past experiences, precisely with the battle groups, where we had a very nice concept, but which has never been deployed. For the review um, uh, mechanism, I had a question about, uh, is, it, uh, is it enough if we have a, an, an annual report? What I would like to say that in, in the past, we didn't have uh, annual reports. I think if the high representative presents every year to the leaders, to the, to the big bosses, uh, an annual report about the implementation of the strategic compass, I can tell you that it exerts a strong pressure on all member states to fulfill their commitments. And for the name and shame, here, personally, I'm full, I fully agree. But we need to be sure that all member states, including Poland, I have to say, uh, agree uh, with uh, the name and shame process. Uh, we had some discussions on PESCO where there are some sensitivities. So uh, the review mechanism, I think it's really something new. I hope it will be adopted by member states in the Compass uh, because it's the only way to push member states to fulfill their commitments. And my last point is about the complementarity with NATO. And, um, had the question on the exercises. Right, um, currently, we have already the battle groups, and nobody said that the EU battle groups were the threat for NATO. The problem with the battle groups is that there, the, there was no uh, the interoperab interoperability was not developed enough, and there were no exercises. When you had two battle groups during the same semester, there was no joint exercises for the two battle groups. So. We think that if, we, if you develop exercises, if you develop joint training with the, with, the, with the battle groups, we think that it will allow um, to, to decide more easily uh, uh, to, to deploy them. If, we know, if member states have trained exercise together, the, the day where, where, when you have the knife at the throat and you have to take a decision, 
the fact that you know that your battle groups have trained together and have made many exercises, I think it's a strong incentive for, for, um, for, for the decision making. And so I would like to be clear on this. The exercises that we are going to do, it's not at all a, 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 prob a, a problem for NATO because we have always said that what we are doing to do in an EU framework, it's also for NATO. It's also for NATO and, and, the, and the forces, uh, modular forces or the battle groups that are going to be trained and exercised, it's an asset for NATO. And, and the last point, on joint exercises with, between EU and NATO, on, personally, I'm totally open for this and I hope we, we could do this. But to have joint exercises, military joint exercises between the two organizations, you need the agreement of all member states and all allies. And when I say all allies, you know, uh, uh, who could be the um, ally which uh, could be a little bit problematic on this. So we are very pragmatic. We will try to go as far as possible and to work in full complementarity, in full coherence with NATO. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Director. That was a, an excellent uh, kickoff of, of um, our conversation. I would like to, uh, to uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Szymański and the, uh, Director Charles Flisk for their uh, introductory uh, remarks and their flexibility of uh, uh, um, uh, enabling us to adjust a bit uh, the agenda of our, our conferen conference, making it more interactive. So thank you very much. Now I would like to announce a um, five minutes break uh, for our technical arrangements and we will start uh, in five minutes uh, the first discussion among the panelists. Thank you very much and uh, see you in a moment.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seat. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seat. Good morning uh, to everybody. Uh, welcome to our panel of uh, experts, uh, creme de la creme of EU expert uh, community. Uh, we will be looking today at EU tools to uh, implement uh, EU strategic autonomy. Uh, what needs to be done uh, in order to first make, an, make EU an effective security player, uh, to face challenges uh, by China, and to strengthen EU impact uh, in the neighborhood towards its systemic rivals. So it is really about the uh, nuts and bolts. Uh, we should not forget that EU uh, has its advantages and disadvantages as a foreign and security actor. Uh, beside slightly sluggish uh, defense cooperation, uh, the EU has other instruments trade measures, development aid, economic sanctions, diplomacy. Uh, the usual problem uh, is lack of member states' willingness and unity to employ the instruments at its disposal. Uh, we will have four excellent speakers uh, to discuss the topic in alphabetic order. Uh, Daniel Fiot, Security and Defense Editor, European Union Institute for Security Studies. Charles Powell, director of Elkanor Royal Institute. Uh, both of them will join us remotely due to health reasons. Christy Reich, uh, director of Estonian Foreign Policy Institute, International Center for Defense and Security. And uh, finally, Justyna Szczudlik, my colleague from PISM, uh, deputy head of research uh, and uh, analyst on China. We will start uh, by short introductory remarks, six, seven minutes. Please keep them short. Um, I should remind uh, our online audience that we have the option to um, put your questions uh, on chat so I can bring them uh, into a debate later on. Uh, let's start first with Hard Power and Daniel Fiot. Uh, Daniel has spent all this year discussing strategic compass in EU capitals. The proposal has been finally out and brought some controversies. So uh, first I would like to ask Daniel, what is the potential of recent proposal of EU strategic compass to strengthen EU as a, a security player? Uh, Daniel, your time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, can I check that you can hear me well uh, in the room? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, f thank you so much um, uh, to PISM uh, for the invitation and real apologies that I uh, cannot be with you in Poland uh, today. I dearly like to, to be there. Um, I would also like to congratulate PISM as well for uh, putting uh, strategic autonomy uh, on the agenda again. Uh, and I think that that's uh, very healthy. I mean, there was a sense, at least in the past, that um, strategic autonomy was only uh, discussed uh, amongst uh, a select few, but now it seems to uh, be that um, uh, as a democratic concept, a lot of people across Europe are discussing it. So that, that I think, is also a good thing. 
Now, on, on the campus, I think already a lot has been said um, by DSG uh, Fries uh, and also the minister, but let me maybe uh, highlight a few points as introductory remarks, and then I'm happy to do, uh, to take questions. Uh, the first thing that we should keep in mind is that the, the campus, at least for those who have read the leaks, attempts to do two things. Uh, on the first, uh, on the one hand, it's a strategic document, which gives a a strategic analysis of where Europe is in the world. Uh, and secondly, it is an action plan. And I think we've already heard that in this morning's remarks, that uh, we are uh, trying to develop not only a common strategic understanding of, the, of Europe's place in the world, but also what we're going to do about it. And that uh, emphasis on action, I think, uh, very important and very clearly uh, from the draft that uh, many of us have seen, uh, the idea of action underlies uh, everything, I think. But it's also important to keep in mind uh, and the compass itself will be a, a, sig a kind of symbol or a signal uh, to a lot of parties. And firstly, it's an internal document. Huh? So it, it signals uh, a kind of common understanding between member states um, on how they see security and defense and the EU's position in the world. Um, I know that uh, many people might get tired of, uh, let's call them Brussels-based processes, but uh, actually the lead up to the campus was really important because it did include a lot of uh, non-papers from member states and also workshops. And besides the content of those workshops and, and um, papers, and of which the EUISS uh, had uh, fortunately a good role in, a, a big role in, what was really intriguing was how the member states came together on certain issues. So we might not want to call this a strategic culture, but it's certainly a culture in the way that we think uh, about the threats and challenges. And I think already, as Mr. Debsky said uh, right at the beginning, there is a sense in which um, uh, a lack of time uh, or even a sense of urgency uh, underpins everything uh, we should think about in foreign policy terms. This is certainly not the early uh, millennium uh, of thinking about CSDP. The challenges are quite profound and definitely on our doorstep, as, as we can see. So, um, in, a question, in a sense, uh, the compass is an internal signaling uh, document, and I'm sure it will become that. It will be a testament for how far the member states firstly see the world uh, in common terms, and secondly, what action points they want to develop. Secondly, it's a signal to strategic competitors. And uh, here, I guess uh, the, the drafting team should take some credit for at least developing the concept of strategic competitors even before uh, many other powers around the world. It seems to be a very suitable way of uh, describing uh, Uh, but it's not only just a signal to them, uh, it's also a signal to partners. And I think that has also been underlined uh, very, very uh, um, uh, carefully already today. Um, so a lot of signals being sent about what the EU wants to do. I think one of the important conclusions that we can all draw from this even though it was that the general conclusion of the threat analysis that the EU is facing a deteriorating strategic uh, environment is very clear. And uh, I've heard already today a lot of people talk about anticipation, uh, intelligence. Um, this is absolutely fundamental uh, to the concept of strategic autonomy and even to the compass itself. It's not just about acting, but it's about reading uh, the situation and having a common uh, approach to that as well. So the threat analysis was unfortunately right in that sense, that we're in a worse uh, position um, uh, today than maybe in the past, certainly even since the global strategy. And that it's also right that every five years, the member states uh, and, and telecoms comes together to conduct such um, an exercise as well. Uh, on the uh, capacities, uh, there is a huge uh, emphasis on action, of course, and the implementation uh, of these actions is really important. And, uh, that in some cases, deliverables should be already on the table um, within two or three years. Uh, that's really important, I think. Uh, 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 for political commitment to the conclusions of the campus, given that this is a member state document. Obviously, other areas will take a bit longer, uh, so certain military capabilities may take a bit more time, but certainly in the questions uh, related to capability development, um, the campus is also there important, because as you know, we already have things such as PESCO, uh, EDF, um, the CARD. The campus gives them greater strategic direction, and. Um, I think this was also mentioned by DSG Freeze, 
the way the compass will be uh, adopted uh, at the highest level by the European Council gives us that inbuilt pressure to make sure that member states live up to already their existing commitments in such tools. And that's really important, not to see them just as um, um, uh, processes or policy processes, but actually uh, a strategic investment uh, themselves. That's really, really important. Um, for question of the rapid uh, capacity, rapid deployment capacity. Again, I think DSG freeze was quite uh, clear in the, in the full meaning of that term. Actually, it's not about the force. It's about all of the obstacles that we know exist uh, that have stopped the EU from acting in the past. Decision making, uh, strategic enablers, um, the ability to exercise and anticipate. You know, members of the members don't seem to have been very naive on that point. They understand this is a concrete way of addressing it. Uh, final point, if I can, um, before listening to my uh, fellow panelists and, and taking questions. I think the compass is also very important to access out. Um, some people may call it unfairly the, the, the kind of straitjacket of CSDP. As we know, the CSDP uh, is, is a very important part of the EU security and defense um, uh, policy and, and position in the world. Um, but there is a sense in which um, the challenges maybe uh, are not well addressed by CSDP on its own. So one of the things that the company is really good is take us from pure CSDP uh, to EU security and defense a bit more broadly. And that is a really important evolution, I think, uh, in the EU strategic thinking. We have heard already about the importance of hybrid uh, threats. We see that in, in clear daylight uh, in front of us uh, on our television uh, screens and even closer as well uh, to home. But it's also important as well to consider that when we think of strategic competitors uh, and crisis response, uh, that we need to take a broader view. And this includes, indeed, uh, outer space, uh, the air domain, maritime space as well, and sun. Um, and in fact, I probably depart from, from the view of having this neat um, um, differentiation between territorial defense and what else goes on around the world, because I think they are in, uh, intrinsically linked. Um, uh, if you look at the actions of Russia and China around the world, Clearly, they do not have a um, uh, uh, maybe as clear a um, do when it comes to geographical scope and territory. So I think this is a question also to the wider uh, defense perspective of the states. Um, we've heard that as transatlantic, etc. It's very important that that happens. Uh, but it's also a recognition that the EU has a whole set of tools that can be used uh, in a broader perspective uh, to the question of European security of its member states and also of its citizens. So I will leave it there for my initial impulse statement and uh, happy to take any questions uh, from the floor. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, uh, could I have uh, one follow-up question to you? Uh, in relation to EU rapid deployment capacity, how do you feel where there could be a member state's consensus uh, in which region uh, such uh, capacities could be used in practice? You know, uh, there is a kind of skepticism in Baltic states uh, and in Central European countries uh, about this. You know, in 2014, it occurred that um, the EU was not capable to launch a very a, a, an EU mission in Ukraine with a very hard mandate. So, you know, from the perspective of this region, what's the point of uh, agreeing to such forces when you know that they will not be used against Russia? Yeah, thank you very much. That, that's an excellent follow-on question. I think it all depends on where we think Russia is uh, present in the world. Um, let's be very clear on that, that um, uh, the, its presence is more intensely felt in the eastern neighborhood, if we could call it this, or the eastern flank. Uh, but Russia's uh, strategic ambitions do not end there. Uh, and in, in fact, if you look even in the Sahel, uh, northern Africa, the Middle East, uh, Russia has also its geopolitical interests there. And we must be wary of that, and we must think uh, about that question. Uh, what was said earlier about time and urgency is really important. If you look at how um, Russia in particular acts, it is very quickly. Uh, it is by proxy forces, um, and it is by the deployment of military capabilities very quickly. 
And they do that, of course, to change the political facts on the ground. And let's be honest here, it makes life for the EU very, very difficult in those circumstances to give up uh, geographical space, political space to such forces. So what I'm trying to say here, I think, is that um, we need to think uh, not ex in exclusive terms south versus east, but the whole geographical area. One may even extend it even into the Arctic and the high north, by the way, as well, and broader on maritime spaces, in cyber domain, etc., etc., where we cannot afford to treat a strategic competitors in one geographically confined space. They are global, they are regional, and we must act uh, also accordingly on that basis. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we will now move uh, to Christy Reich. Uh, Christy, how do you assess your capabilities to operationalize strategic, strategic autonomy? Uh, should, there, should there be a place for instruments related to deterrence of Russia? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the question and thank you to PISM for inviting me. Very happy to be here and congratulations on putting together this uh, important and uh, timely discussion. Um, let me start by referring a little bit uh, back in uh, recent uh, history when the EU created CFSB and CSDP. That was during the post-Cold War era, when the international security environment was exceptionally favorable, I would say, for Europe. And that is very well reflected in the first European security strategy from 2003. And then we compare it to the global strategy of 2016 and the most recent document now, the strategic compass, and we can see the huge uh, deterioration of, uh, of the security environment. But even in the 1990s, it was already evident that uh, the shortages of uh, European kind of harder instruments of power were actually preventing the EU or Europe from resolving crises in its own immediate uh, neighborhood. Most obviously in the 90s, it was the wars in the former Yugoslavia. And ever since then, we have been discussing this lack of uh, European hard power capabilities. And yet uh, the progress has been very limited, as we have also heard uh, in the previous, um, previous presentations today. And now we are in a completely different global environment with the contestation between great powers and kind of antagonistic environment where the EU really has difficulties in kind of finding its place and finding the right approach. It has some advantages uh, in the field of uh, regulatory power and economic power, but it also has very obvious weaknesses, especially at the kind of harder end of uh, instruments. So when it comes to European strategic autonomy in this uh, context, it is an important aspiration, but it is very far from uh, reality. As we heard already, Europe is not actually able to take full responsibility for its own security today. And so the only feasible framework for discussing European security and how to, to manage it is the comprehensive framework that has to include the EU and NATO, thus also the United States. I know I don't need to convince anyone in, in Warsaw about that, uh, but uh, this has been a much uh, debated issue across uh, Europe. And uh, so this mantra that ha we have also heard today, that uh, European capabilities need to be strengthened in a manner that, manner that uh, um, contributes both to the EU and NATO, uh, this is a crucial one. And, and we also already heard um, references to different practical problems on the way of actually moving in that direction. So it is a very important slogan but now we really need to work hard to make it uh, implemented in practice. And we all know that as long as NATO is there, the EU will not take over responsibility for territorial defense of Europe. But uh, a very important point I would like to emphasize is that, especially 
in our region, in the Baltic states and Poland. Perhaps we should make a stronger effort and try to be more creative in actually thinking about ways in which European defence cooperation that takes place in the EU framework can more concretely uh, contribute to NATO, that can meet like the real capability needs that are important for NATO. Because so far what we have seen in the discussions and plans on how to strengthen European uh, strategic autonomy, it is not geographically balanced. And it's partly because uh, we, I mean countries in this region, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, the Baltic States, Poland, we have been so skeptical and hesitant about this very concept of European strategic autonomy for good reasons. And uh, then the strategic autonomy discussion has been more focused on, on the South, on crisis uh, management. And we are in a situation where the EU's contribution to security in our region is quite limited. But it doesn't need to be this way. Nothing prevents from using the EU instruments and resources more to actually uh, addressing uh, the needs of NATO as well and including the needs of territorial defence when it comes to development of capabilities. We have the example of military mobility, which is a, a good one, but uh, there could be more. And, and on a more political level, as a think tanker, I, I have to point it out that we do see the United States reorienting its foreign and security policy priorities. And I believe we have only seen the beginning of it. And it's a little bit of a political taboo, again, in, in Poland and the Baltic states, where, of course, the transatlantic relationship is so important uh, for us and politically, our countries need to make every effort to keep it as strong as possible. But uh, we, as analysts, uh, we need to also think about future scenarios when the US contribution might actually reduce. And uh, then how is Europe ready to cope with such a situation? Then we need to look at our, our partners and allies in Europe. And we will always be part of Europe. We will always be next to Germany, for example, which is a crucial country for, for the regional security in the Baltic Sea region. And, and our stability of the Baltic states and Poland will all, always be a crucial issue for Germany. So this is one direction to look at. Germany will have to make a much stronger contribution. And uh, my final related point is that Another shortcoming in the European strategic autonomy discussion is that uh, it has been focused a lot on EU initiatives. But as it was also previously mentioned, in the end, the capabilities are owned by member states. And so it's not, not enough to have more initiatives at the EU level and even perhaps more integration to some extent. But in the end, what is crucial is whether member states enhance their contribution to European security in the different frameworks, EU and NATO. And, and uh, the situation today is not good at all when we look at who provides for security in our region uh, and also looking in, in the foreseeable future. We have no reason in the Baltic states to kind of trust Germany or the other European powers more when it comes to the provision of security for, for our region than we trust the United States. But it is in vital interest of countries in our region to actually build and strengthen the trust and solidarity among European countries and, and to strengthen the European capabilities and the political will to, to act together. These things go hand in hand. And, and I do think this strategic compass process is something that uh, pushes us to do so. And we are all taking part in numerous discussions across Europe and discussing the disagreements and kind of 
building this common, more common shared sense of uh, how to how to um, protect and defend European security in future. I will stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Christy. As a moderator, I need to uh, find constructive uh, proposals. So uh, my follow-up question to you is, uh, in which areas uh, do you think the EU could constructively uh, contribute to EU-NATO NATO cooperation? I mean, uh, Charles Fries uh, has been talking lots about cyber, countering cyber security threats. Uh, maybe it is uh, also uh, the issue of countering uh, the online disinformation. I mean, we are facing lots of transnational uh, challenges uh, in which EU is uh, better positioned sometimes uh, to face the challenges that member states, for instance, in talking with uh, big tech companies, uh, you know, uh, it is a relevant uh, partner. So could you, could you, te could you tell us what, what could be something constructive to go on? Well, you mentioned uh, cyber that has, of course, been uh, an important uh, area of EU-NATO cooperation and a kind of relatively less controversial one, and I believe it will be a very strong uh, priority also in future. But uh, then staying still on the more military side, there is still a lot of room for improvement in actually making coordination between the EU and NATO capability planning processes and exercises uh, much stronger and smoother. Because this is, in the end, uh, I think, a very important uh, question. And it's, uh, it's a very practical question when we get to the kind of strategic level discussions, to the kind of practical choices that the defense planners have to make. They are still faced with this question of having to make uh, choices. So the more integrated and coordinated we can make these EU and NATO planning processes, uh, the better it is than and also for like uh, addressing uh, a comprehensive uh, set of security threats and we can't look at uh, military and non-military threats like separated from each other uh, we often hear it in the eu discussions that the eu has an advantage in the field of many non-military uh, fields and uh, indeed especially in the field of the economy and technology, it has all its uh, regulatory power, or let's take energy, which is like even more relevant perhaps in, in our uh, region. But when we look at the hybrid scenarios, uh, like the one now going on at the Belarusian EU border, even if it is a non-military scenario, the military power is always looming there in the background, and this possibility that uh, the conflict escalates. So we need to have the full spectrum of uh, capabilities to, to deal with these kind of threats and, and of course always trying to avoid the escalation, but uh, hard power matters even in the age of uh, increasingly hybrid forms of uh, uh, crisis. Thank you, Christy. And uh, now we will move to uh, Charles Powell. Uh, we've been talking lots of hard uh, power, but um, I would like to ask uh, the question um, to Charles about how can be strategic autonomy concept operationalized uh, better in order to project stability on the southern flank of Europe? Uh, I mean, beside uh, hard tools, uh, what kind of soft power uh, the EU could employ more effectively? Please, Charles, go on. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. And let me, first of all, thank you for having invited me to this very interesting seminar. I very much wanted to be there in person, but sadly, uh, the COVID pandemic has interfered with my plans yet again. Um, let me just start with a very obvious point, but I think it's one which hasn't been stressed sufficiently this morning, and that is that strategic autonomy begins at home. Um, what I mean by this is that Europe is not uh, going through its most impressive or healthy uh, moment, I think we could argue. Um, and of course, this is partly due to the pandemic, but not only due to the pandemic. And countries like Spain and Italy, as you all know, have been particularly badly hit. So the first point or the first caveat is that we need to strengthen our democracies. We need to 
improve our political unity within the EU and we need to uh, deepen our socio-economic resist, uh, resilience if we uh, want to be able to project this um, hard power that, that you were talking about. Um, it's true that we often hear and often say that uh, strategic autonomy is likely to be most relevant in the southern neighborhood and the argument that's normally given is that this is because the EU's toolbox um, is likely to be more useful there. This isn't to say, of course, that the EU's toolbox will be irrelevant elsewhere, but at the same time, let me add another caveat, um, this time referring to the Western Balkans. Frankly, the situation in the, world, in the Western Balkans is not uh, terribly promising, and the fact that the EU is finding it so difficult uh, to influence um, developments in a region which is so close to us, which is inhabited by only uh, 16 million people who are already reasonably well aligned with us, both economically and politically, um, points to the challenges that we're going to face in, in the southern neighborhood. So the situation in the southern, southern neighborhood, as we all know, is, is not good. Um, we're surrounded by the proverbial ring of fire. There are civil wars in Libya, Syria, and Yemen. We've seen mass protests in Algeria, Iraq, Lebanon, and Sudan. In other words, the drivers of the uh, 2011 uprisings, the so-called Arab Spring, uh, basically remain as uh, strong as ever. And our response so far has basically been very short-term and very uh, transactional. We have basically tried to address the migration issues and the threat of terrorism without really addressing uh, the underlying causes of this instability. So basically the easy answer to your question is that the EU needs to, we need to provide more investment. Um, we need to be willing to accept greater responsibility and also greater risk taking. Now the irony of course is that the EU has actually reduced funding for the neighborhood. It's um, actually cut the funding in half from about um, 111 billion to 98 billion in the multi-annual financial framework for 21 to 27. So this is a little bit ironic. Furthermore, I think that in the past, we've mainly concentrated on state resilience, not uh, societal resilience. And therefore we need to invest much more in the region's social and human capital. And of course, helping them deal with the um, COVID pandemic itself um, isn't a bad place to start. Let me uh, finally pick up on something that a recent study by ECFR um, has concluded. I'm a member of the Spanish chapter of ECFR, so I'm, um, I have no conflict of interest here. Um, basically, in order to increase the EU's uh, potential to exert greater influence, um, this study proposes five recommendations. The first is that we need to overcome EU disunity. Um, which was in evidence, for example, between uh, France and Italy over Libya. <clears throat> and this, of course, makes us very vulnerable to cherry picking by third parties in the region. Secondly, and this, of course, may be more controversial in, in, the, in the eyes of some member states, um, we may perhaps have to decouple from US policy in the region. We are widely seen as America's poodle by many local actors. And we are widely seen as being subservient, even in the areas in which we are strongest. In other words, economic, the areas of economic and trade policy. Um, for some people will think this is ironic, given that the EU and the US fell out over Iran. But local perceptions, I think, are very important and we should take notice of them. Thirdly, we need to make better use of uh, the EU's assets. In other words, play to our strengths. And I think... My, my headline here would be that the EU plays a strong hand very weakly. Um, we are an, a major economic power in the region. Um, the EU represents about 20% of Middle East and North Africa's global trade, but we don't leverage this uh, sufficiently. And for example, the shortening of uh, value chains might be a way of doing this. And I'm thinking in particular of countries of particular relevance to Spain, such as Morocco. Let's not forget we have association agreements with Algeria, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, and Morocco. But again, um, we don't seem to be using those terribly effectively. Secondly, with regard to diplomacy, we are often uh, perceived in the region as a relatively benign, uh, neutral actor. 
which I think is a very useful thing in the context of growing polarization. So we are still, in fact, regarded as a mediating power, but again, we often don't use this efficiently. And finally, we have very strong civil society connections, which we could build on much more than we do. The fourth suggestion is that we need to pick the right priorities. Um, actors in the region, quite rightly, perceive that we are only really interested in limiting migration and tackling uh, terrorism. Um, and of course, um, as I was saying, this is largely true. But in order to deal with migration, which is a very legitimate European concern, I think we need to develop more balanced partnerships with the countries of origin and the countries of transit. Um, some authors have suggested, for example, that we should try to develop a more sustainable social contract between the EU and third countries in the MENA region. And here, again, playing to our strengths, the EU can offer something that very few actors can offer, which is a, a multifaceted partnership, which inc including things like trade, debt relief, uh, development aid, policy on labor migration, plus, of course, cooperation in key areas such as security, energy, and uh, climate change. Additionally, we're pretty good at dealing with other regional uh, entities, and I'm thinking here in particular of the African Union. Now, admittedly, obviously, migration uh, will always be our priority, but not necessarily their priority, and therefore, we need to move beyond the transactional deals that we've struck with countries like uh, Turkey um, and listen more carefully to their um, aspirations and concerns. And finally, the fifth recommendation is that we need to build European coalitions in order to exercise influence in the MENA region. Uh, you've mentioned Germany with regard to the Baltic states um, and Poland, of course. Uh, here, I think one has to mention France. I mean, France, France is obviously the pivotal power uh, as far as the southern neighborhood is concerned. And of course, we need to recognize that not all EU member states are equally interested or willing or, or able to engage in the region. And therefore, um, we need to uh, essentially uh, be more flexible and more creative when it comes to forging European co coalitions. And if we fail to do that, the alternative points quite simply is growing unilateralism, as we have uh, already seen France uh, indulge in in a number of crises. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charles, uh, for this comprehensive uh, answer. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, EU is an economic actor in sovereign neighborhood, but the uh, others has better leverages than the EU. Russia, Russia has managed to build military bases in Syria, and you have China working on cyber security uh, standards with Egypt. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. there is lots. Uh, there is a huge gap between EU tools and uh, the other players. My follow-up question to you is related to US-China rivalry and how uh, the EU could position. Um, how do you feel? What would be the best way for the EU to position itself towards uh, United States in this uh, US-Chinese uh, competition? You know, to have a cake and eat a cake. Thanks. Uh, yes, a $10 million dollar, dollar question or euro question. Um, this obviously in a, in a growing context of China-US rivalry is, is going to take up a lot of our time and energy. We are not equidistant. Uh, we are much closer to the United States in terms of our values and interests. I think everyone acknowledges this. However, we are still smarting. We are still recovering from the impact of the Trump administration and, of course, um, we cannot by any means exclude another Trump administration a couple of years down the road, um, which would obviously have <laughs> very major consequences for all of the issues that we've been discussing here today. Um, I think that strategic autonomy is, in fact, our answer to this dilemma. Um, I, I was very pleased to hear so many of you repeat that... Um, you know, we will continue to depend on the United States for our defense. This is obviously... Um, unquestionable. Um, what really interests me, though, is, um, you know, what are the other dangers involved in strategic autonomy? In other words, how can we deal with the Chinese threat while remaining true 
to our fundamental core EU values and interests. And there are two, um, I think, problems that particularly worry me, at least. Um, one is that strategic autonomy may lead to a dangerous concentration of power within the internal market, within the EU. Um, concentration of power both in hands of large companies and also groups of member states. In other words, for example, how do we um, prevent national champions, particularly French and German champions, from effectively becoming European champions in a manner which actually undermines internal competitions? In, in other words, how do we compete with China without stamping out EU, without stamping out competition within the EU, which is one of our core uh, fundamental uh, principles? And in the field of defense, of course, the question here is, will Polish, Italian and Spanish companies survive uh, in, in the face of closer Franco-German collaboration, a collaboration which will ultimately largely be subsidized by EU funds? So striking a balance between concentration and competition would be key. The other issue that worries me is protectionism. And again, you know, we are preaching, we are preaching to the Chinese. We are, we're trying to get them to open up their market. Um, but of course, if China and, and even the US remain rather closed, uh, as they currently are, in fact, uh, will we have to act similarly? In other words, will we have to become a protectionist eco economy, um, which would, in fact, of course, greatly weaken interdependence, which is, again, one of our, our core values. Um, and I haven't heard the expression used this morning, I think, which is open strategic autonomy. Why, why is so much stress being placed on this open strategic autonomy? Because I think there is a real danger of protectionism, for example, resulting from our climate uh, policy, which we all support. But um, again, we have to craft it very carefully so as to escape the trap of protectionism. So basically, to conclude, what I'm arguing is that in our struggle against uh, Chinese um, competitiveness in our struggle against uh, an in, in our attempt to to survive in this growing context of china u s rivalry, we may sadly end up undermining some of the very fundamental principles uh, which the EU stands for. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. You flagged up something very important for this region, bearing in mind a huge digital divide. Uh, it is, you know, a question how to balance the, the role of inclusiveness of all member states and at the same time build uh, those huge projects related to uh, high tech in defense, uh, etc. Uh, now, I would like to move to Justyna Studlik and uh, the question on China. How uh, China perceived uh, EU strategic autonomy? How, uh, what is your assessment of the effectiveness of EU instruments uh, to, of strategic autonomy towards China? Please go on, Justyna. Uh, thanks, Ella. Good afternoon to all of you. It's my great pleasure to be co-speaker uh, with this so distinguished uh, speakers from um, um, from Europe. Uh, as uh, as Ella said, I would like to focus on China as, in, as I'm dealing with China here, being the the analyst at PISM. and I I will try to to uh, to focus on two points as Ella asked me about China's perception of on um, and the, or the assessment of the strategic autonomy concept um, and my assessment if the, the autonomous measures that EU has already implemented or um, uh, if uh, those measures are effective. So uh, um, about the Chinese stance on uh, strategic autonomy concept, in a nutshell I can say that China presents a schizophrenic view uh, on this concept, we can also say that is is based on let's say main contradiction, um, which is important in the dialect, uh, dialectical materialism. Which is, to be honest, this concept is present in Chinese uh, Communist Party communiques that we could uh, could they are published very very often. Uh, and um, also, this is a, ki a kind of example of Chinese cakeism to have a cake and to eat a cake and have a cake. In a nutshell, on the one hand, China supports or endorses the strategic autonomy concept, this idea as a whole, but on the other hand, of course, criticizes or very or dislikes or hates 
these autonomous defensive measures that EU has already set up or is talking about a new, uh, this kind of, um, th those measures. When it comes to the first part of this, of the story that China supports, there are many vindication of, um, of, that, uh, of, that, of that fact. You can find various remarks um, about the strategic autonomy concept given by Chinese, uh, not only Chinese uh, experts affiliated to the Chinese uh, think tanks, but also um, officials, including high level uh, officials like Xi Jinping. There are many, many quotations um, of course, I have this quotation here, but we do not have enough time to, to, to talk about it. But generally speaking, Xi Jinping uh, talking to uh, uh, with Angela Merkel, Macron, Charles Michel, um, he says openly that China supports the strategic autonomy, but, and this but is very important, I think, uh, he hopes that the EU will make correct or right judgment or choice and achieve um, or realize a real strategic autonomy. Uh, he also says about um, uh, making some distinctions be between right and wrong. So I think it's pretty obvious uh, a message that what China would like to see is, let's say, strategic autonomy with Chinese characteristics, which means that uh, China would like to uh, see EU as a uh, less dependent on the US or uh, would like to prevent transatlantic cooperation on or against China. Uh, as I said, um, there are also uh, criticism about um, this, uh, let's say, um, autonom autonomous or defensive measures that EU uh, set up or is working on um, uh, right now. And it was two weeks ago, uh, Chinese um, ambassador uh, to the EU uh, gave um, uh, an interview to the Financial Times and the full transcript of this interview is available on the Chinese uh, website of the Chinese um, mission to the EU. And it is pretty, uh, pretty concise and clear, uh, let's say, assessment about these um, autonomous measures. Uh, uh, there are four main concerns when it comes to the, to the defensive measures that, that EU uh, is uh, setting up or is working on. The first one is, uh, as Ambassador said, that the trade economic issues have been politicized according to, to Chinese side, and this leads to the distortions of market principles. So it is a hint to the EU that we as the EU are violating our norms and rules when it comes, let's say, about the um, free trade and free market. Uh, the second concern is about the, the fact that this, there is increasing amount of tailor-made tools that and the target are con concrete um, countries and the enterprises and of course those tools are in the discriminatory and there are violations of the market principles and fairness and justice. The third concern is that there is a there is abuse of the US single market and Ambassador also mentioned that not only Chinese but also EU uh, companies are, are very unhappy about this fact because those measures are pretty, let's say, um, uh, could, uh, could lead to some kind of, uh, let's say, could be detrimental for EU-China relations to, for China but also for the global trade. And of course, the fourth, the fourth concern is that um, China, uh, that EU is becoming more inward looking and um, uh, of course they are creating uh, new trade um, barriers and what is interesting, uh, Chinese side says that um, those um, instruments are not in line with the spirit and principle of WTO. And the um, and the fourth, uh, the fifth, uh, let's say, concerns. It's not from the from this um, uh, interview uh, given by ambassador, but also looking what Chinese press and Chinese officials are talking about. I would like to say about the sanctions that EU uh, imposed on Chinese officials uh, uh, under this remit of uh, um, uh, EU Magnitsky Act, if I may put it in this way. So the Chinese press uh, and officials says that those sanctions demonstrate EU's moral arrogance and uh, it is an intent to try to interfere in China's internal affairs. Um, and um, also there's some kind of uh, f um, uh, voices that EU is doing that because there's some kind of um, fake news about China within the EU uh, discourse. So this is the, um, the uh, let's say, the landscape or the, or the um, short um, uh, description how China perceives the, uh, the, the strategic autonomy. Um, 
And now I'd like to say a few words about my perception, my assessment of uh, the effectiveness of those um, uh, of those instruments that are operational. So one remark before I start to, to, to present my, uh, my understanding, my assessment. I would like to say that we should bear in mind that um, there are several uh, autonomous measures that have been already implemented or are, or are operational, but also there are uh, instruments that uh, still are still under preparation. So even though even those uh, instruments that um, are um, are operational are pretty, let's say, young, and very, and, and so uh, from this perspective, it's difficult to to say if they are really effective. So when it comes to China, I think that we could talk about this, let's say, four instrument, if I'm not mistaken, about investment screening, of course, that um, is operational since October 2020, so a year. A 5G toolbox um, presented or published in January 2020. And also, as this Magnitsky Act, of course, which is the, the name is about um, council decisions concerning rest, uh, restrictive measures against serious uh, human rights violation and abuses, that was set up in December 2020, and also the let's say renewed um, or um, renewed EU uh, export control regime. I'm talking about dual use regulations that entered into force um, in September uh, this year. And this, um, this let's say, um, novelty is that um, it um, embraces uh, sensitive goods, services, software, and technology that can be used for both uh, civilian and military purposes. And of course, we have uh, other instruments still under the discussion or preparation international procurement instrument. Um, which could be, uh, a def let's say, even offensive measure when it comes to China, because it could have impact on China's access to European public procurement uh, bids. But, and it tells us um, um, that um, um, uh, the EU put uh, this um, discussion on hold before the um, conclusion of negotiations of CHI last year. So now, this year, there's a kind of a speed up of talks about it. And of course, the, um, uh, the talks about supply chain due diligence, uh, some problems within the member states, how to, uh, how to compose it. Um, uh, it would be, uh, generally speaking, the ban on the sale of goods produced with forced labor and anti-coercion instrument. Also some discussion how, what kind of uh, response it could be. Sanctions, um, some limit, um, uh, limit access to the uh, European EU's market. So, of course, um, other uh, other instruments that are mostly focused on um, um, some defensive elements of the EU global gateway strategy as a, as a response to the China's Belt Road Initiative, uh, European Chips Act, and European Cyber uh, Resilience Act. So, when it comes to the instruments that we have in place, of course, we have uh, we could talk about the effectiveness from two perspectives let's say, specific concrete results, and I'm talking about the um, report that was presented by the Commission, and we can talk about this uh, uh, investment screening, but also this uh, 5G, uh, 5G toolbox and export control, uh, about these dual use instruments, but, bef uh, but without this element, the new elements about this um, uh, that was uh, established or uh, adopted in September, but also some general specific, um, let's say, um, some messages that we are sending both to China and to, uh, to, to member states, if I may put it in this way. So when it comes to this, some, uh, some let's say, um, uh, information from the report uh, given by the Commission about the screening, of course, it's, it's really difficult to say to, some ex to, to, to which extent it is a very good um, instrument. Um, there is information that China is among the five uh, top five countries uh, um, that the um, investments from those countries uh, uh, have been screened. Uh, so it tells us something about it. But one one important important remark that there is a um, let's say uh, less and less investments from China, and because of COVID. But I think that it this trend also started before. Uh, before COVID, since the very beginning when the EU started to talk about these instruments, uh, China um, decided to uh, invest less in the, uh, in the EU. 
Uh, about this uh, export control, of course, there's no information about uh, this, the, the, the new uh, elements about that was established in, uh, in September. About 5G toolbox, there is um, information that, um, that all uh, member states have launched the process to review and strengthen security measures applicable to the, uh, to the to 5G uh, networks and, um, and identified areas where the measures have not been implemented so far. But I think that the, most import the more important um, is the, some, general, um, uh, some general, let's say, um, uh, perception, because it sends a message both to the EU and China. I, I know that you sh I should, uh, I should uh, stop here, but two, two or three sentences. Um, so I think that what is very important, um, um, and it shows us that those uh, instruments are effective because I'm to be to be frank I'm pretty positive when it comes to do what EU is doing about China is the fact that China is afraid of this kind of um, EU's uh, policy which is let's say sharpen um, and uh, the fact that China is perceived to some extent as a strategic uh, systemic rival. So the fact that this criticism about, the, about these um, instruments, I think is a very good example that there is a kind of, that China feels the pressure from the, uh, from the EU. Um, mm, as I said, less Chinese investments in the EU even before the COVID, it was a kind of a, uh, of a result of the talks about investment screening mechanism. Uh, it is also examples that the EU is um, is doing um, or perceiving uh, uh, China on its own terms, and of course, it also uh, important uh, important message for the EU as 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 such and member states. The fact there is a debate about China and security dimension of our cooperation with China is very essential, and I I think we should appreciate. Uh, there is a kind of, because of the debate, because, the, because of the work about these uh, strategic uh, autonomous measures or defensive measure, there is a process of identification of use vulnerabilities and our weak points. Also, the better information sharing in the case of uh, investment screening. Also, it's an impulse for other countries to set up um, uh, in national investment screening mechanism or strengthen on. Uh, upgrade the existing ones, uh, also setting the standards, and uh, of course there's a kind of a pressure to create um, a, a, a pressure on member states to do something on China. And the last remark, I think that uh, we are talking about some loopholes in uh, several uh, defensive measures, especially in screening, because it's mostly about this um, information sharing and some opinions from the from the Commission. But I think that in case of China, uh, EU is pretty quick because we started to talk about screening in 2017, and we have it in place. And there are many other uh, other instruments are being uh, under preparation. Thank you, Justyna, for good news that EU foreign policy works, uh, finally. Uh, I will open uh, the floor for the discussion and I will take some questions uh, from, uh, from the participants physically present here. Uh, but uh, I will give a preference uh, first for our online audience. And I have two questions. First, it is a question to Mr. Fiot. Uh, in your opinion, is bilateral security and defense cooperation involving Germany, France and the UK more an opportunity or a threat for the EU's possible strategic autonomy? This is a question from um, Mr. Piotr Śledź. Another question uh, from online audience is uh, from Agnieszka Legucka. And it is related to Eastern neighborhood. So probably uh, whoever f f think, uh, wh whoever wants to answer it, uh, it may take this question. Will strategic compass play any particular role in the Eastern neighborhood? How about its approach to Russia? Uh, my question, uh, because I, I have not posed a question to Justyna as a, a follow-up, will be about uh, you know, uh, your assessment of effectiveness of Belt and Road uh, uh, 
uh, initiative of China because you know in coming days European Commission uh, will will uh, launch a new global uh, connectivity strategy which is slightly delayed answer to Belt and Road. Uh, initiative. So, uh, and there are various uh, different views, different assessments of Belt and Road. Ones that it is a PR only. So, I'm wondering uh, if the EU is is really having something to respond to. <laughs> okay. And now, uh, please uh, ask your questions uh, from here. Anybody who feel bold uh, enough to. Ask a question, Monica. Please present yourself and come to microphone. Uh. Is it on? Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Monica Sus. I'm from the Hertie School in Berlin and from the Polish Academy of Sciences. And I have two questions. One question would be to uh, Daniel, and the second question would be to Christy, if I may. I will start with Christy. You referred to the crucial role of Germany as a regional security, let's say, provider in this region. And we also know that the strategic compass idea originated in Berlin in the crisis of the AKK, so of the former defense ministry, uh, minister, and now we have the new government coming in, in Berlin. And of course, um, my question would be uh, directed, let's say, more into the future, and I would like to ask you um, about your opinion on what can we expect from the new German government. We have seen the coalition uh, agreement that has been published last week, and we already more or less know who will be in charge of the foreign and, and defense issues and uh, I would be interested in these two inter interrelated issues that is what can we expect from Germany in terms of let's say securing the eastern flank but also what can we expect from the new German government in terms of uh, German commitment to the European defense CSDP but also in a broader sense and one short question to Daniel if I may uh, you talked a lot and I think we can all agree uh, with you that the strategic compass uh, puts forward a broad security understanding of security, right? So we know that the boundaries between internal and external security are very blurred nowadays. And I mean, it is not a new thing, but I think that we are um, kind of, you know, uh, being more aware of that than, let's say, five years ago. And um, the implementation of the global strategy kind of showed us that it is crucial that all the institutions and all stakeholders of EU foreign security defense community cooperate with each other. And I'm talking about the member states, but of course also on the, about the EU institutions. And my question is a bit more technical maybe, what is the role of the European Commission in the preparations of the strategic compass? Because in the end, if we are talking about internal security dimension, there will be a lot of need for the European Commission to step in and to use the tools that Commission can provide in terms of securing security for the continent. Thank you. Thank you, Monika. I, I've got a message that Martin Terlikowski has some questions uh, online. Yes, good morning. Hello, it's Martin Terlikowski again. I have uh, two more specific questions, but two different ones. Uh, one to Daniel. On the defense industrial and generally industrial dimension, but particularly the defense industrial part is what I'm interested in. Basically, uh, the Compass uh, argues that NATO is the first and foremost partner of, of, of EU in security and defense, and the US comes into this, this, this equation as a, as, a, as a pillar of NATO, actually, right? Uh, we have new instruments in EU, EU uh, US relationship which, which involve defense industry. But I'm afraid, and this is something what many other analysts indicate, that there are areas in which defense industrial interests of the US are incompatible with, with Europe. Simply, this is about sovereignty, or I would say sovereign control over certain technologies, uh, which, of course, the US would like to sell on the uh, um, European market, and Europe would like to, to, to offer worldwide uh, beating uh, American uh, uh, um, uh, competitors, right? So, so there is this. Um, uh, I would say, natural um, uh, uh, tension there. So do you think that we can move on to, to find niches, areas where there could be some form of transatlantic defense industrial cooperation? I don't know. Emerging and disruptive technology is something I know you also work hardly on uh, space assets. Uh, uh, can you maybe elaborate uh, on, on that? 
And a broader question maybe I'd like to ask um, uh, someone else from the panel to comment, maybe uh, uh, our Estonian representative, please take, to, to elaborate on, on the threat perception part of the compass, because I think that what also has been signaled in the uh, opening session by, uh, by a question from Mukas Kulesa, uh, the compass is uh, on the one hand quite uh, open about where the threats and challenges to Europe's security lay, but at the same time, it doesn't really pronounce Russia as a threat. Uh, it quite surprisingly focuses on the fact that somewhere in the future, may, this uh, sta current state of play may, may be no longer viable and Russia will, I don't know, democratize, liberalize and become a partner of, of Europe. This, is, this was surprising to me. I understand that this comes as a, a, a because of the, 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 the inability to find consensus on Russia language among EU member states. but. But in Poland, it was uh, noted. And how about Estonia? How about the other Baltic states? We could share. Uh, and here we hold on to this, uh, keep this kind of wording about Russia in, in the compass, which is meant to be uh, European Union's next, uh, perhaps the most important strategic document uh, in the last uh, five years. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Probably the question um, about the uh, threat perception can also go to Charles and about the changes uh, on Germany's side. And probably if it comes to Char Charles, um, we could also ask uh, generally what types of crisis manager the EU can be. You know, there is uh, prevalence of uh, civilian missions at the end of the day. Uh, so uh, I think that we should uh, start uh, in uh, alphabetic order uh, from Daniel Fiot. Daniel, your time. Thank you very, very much. And uh, thank you for all of the, for the excellent questions, which I will try to answer uh, in order that I receive them. Firstly, on the bilateral defense um, uh, question, I don't uh, see a contradiction there. In fact, um, uh, bilateral or minilateral defense arrangements have been a fact of life uh, even before EU and CSDP. And if you want to even be bolder than that, you could probably say that CSDP uh, uh, was initiated by a bilateral agreement uh, between France and the UK at San Malo. Uh, even in PESCO, even in EDF, you see that the system is set up for groupings of member states uh, to participate um, at a minimum level bilaterally, uh, but also encouraging this kind of minilateral approach. I think what's important, of course, is to try and make make sure that these uh, arrangements also feed in to some of the critical shortfalls uh, that we face. Uh, and we see a lot of those um, initiatives on a bilateral basis through treaties, uh, but also in initiatives like the European Intervention in Initiative, um, which also try to um, push European defense forward. So I don't necessarily see a contradiction there. Of course, as has already been said, uh, the question with the UK uh, still needs to be um, resolved. Um, as the old saying goes, it takes two to tango. I think from the EU side, there's a willingness uh, but we have to wait and see um, uh, how London uh, shapes up on this. Uh, when it comes to the Eastern neighborhood, I think it's very clear that, uh, as has already been said, the EU has certain restrictions there in the sense that um, um, most member states would probably look towards NATO um, uh, for, um, let's say, military or hard responses uh, in the East. But nonetheless, I think the compass has given uh, the EU and member states a chance to even rethink what we mean by certain concepts such as capacity building, uh, which so far has been focused mainly on security sector reform. That remains and continues to be important, but I think there's also a window of opportunity for us to think about building capacity in partner countries when it comes to cyber defense, cyber security, uh, and also being better prepared to counter hybrid threats, especially with strategic communication and disinformation. Uh, by the way, on all of those points, I think uh, it's very well accepted across uh, uh, both uh, sides of Brussels that uh, EU-NATO engagement on that, on that front makes sense because um, NATO also has um, some gaps as well when it comes to, let's say, under the conventional threshold um, uh, factors. So it's only right that the EU and NATO cooperate on that. And I think... Uh, that evolution of the capacity building concept uh, uh, is a rather important one that applies uh, across the whole of, of the neighborhood. It's just a fact of life, uh, especially given that our CSDP missions, uh, whether they are civilian or military, um, are more frequently even targeted uh, by disinformation campaigns, uh, foreign manipulation, uh, cyber attacks. So even on a very basic 
level of CSDP engagement, I would say, uh, we certainly need to up our game uh, in the crisis management and capacity building uh, dimension. And the Compass does that, uh, I think, very, very uh, carefully. Uh, on Monica's excellent question about uh, institutional convergence and cooperation, of course, uh, sometimes that can be a bit boring for the outside world, I would say, but I'm very glad that you posed that question, because indeed that's another aspect of the Compass, which is uh, to keep in mind that um, you know, it was the HRVP, uh, Borel, uh, who, who presented the first draft. And he's also vice president of the commission. I think when reading the draft of the campus, you see so many areas where uh, the pen holders in the external action service have very clearly seen uh, that the commission uh, has its uh, role to play, whether it be on the European Defence Fund and certain capabilities in defence innovation, whether it be in terms of lowering uh, technological dependencies and securing supply chains, which of course is very, very important. But let's also consider across the whole suite of uh, what we would put under, I guess, the resilience basket, uh, cyber security, critical infrastructure. Um, these are all areas where the Commission is already investing a lot of money, already has a number of initiatives, uh, and uh, that it's only right um, that that feeds into the compass in this much more, let's say, comprehensive um, um, approach uh, to security that the EU has. And I must say that it's already very encouraging to see after the first draft has been presented uh, that even in the Commission there seems to be a certain sense of ownership for the Compass document, even though it's not been fully adopted yet. So that, I think, is, is quite positive uh, as well. Um, on Marcin's uh, excellent question, I would say really the fundamental basis of any, um, let's say, discrepancy or, or discussion about uh, EU-US uh, relations uh, is indeed the industrial one. And uh, I personally move away from this kind of uh, caricature uh, almost of open versus closed economies, but it's very clear, and I think the pandemic has underlined this as well, uh, that we have to, in Europe, invest in our strategic industries. Already it's a big step if we call the defense industry a strategic industry. It was not always a given. We always tended to think of it all also as uh, maybe needing to be opened up uh, to the normal rules of the market. That's not the case. So it's uh, a breaking with naivety, I guess, that uh, the EU stresses the importance of these strategic uh, areas. Now, it is also clear that uh, with certain tools that the EU has developed, that, that clearly underlines uh, uh, industrial competitiveness of the European Union. I think that's uh, uh, not a surprise and should not be a surprise to the US. They are, after all, the masters of that type of um, uh, strategy. So indeed, it will be a sticking point. But I think that there are areas of, of um, let's say, potential uh, cooperation here. I think the EU-US dialogue, even though there needs to be a bit more clarity on what the content of that is, uh, I think there could be a very important discussion uh, in areas such as technology dependencies. And here, uh, bringing the full power of the EU's regulatory power um, to the table is really important. Uh, we've already seen that, by the way, with the um, uh, Trade and Technology Council. But indeed, as you said, Marcin, I think also important in domains such as space, uh, where the EU has already autonomous capacities. Uh, and as we've seen because of recent events, uh, space becoming a very vulnerable and is a very vulnerable uh, strategic domain for the Europeans. So we have to speak with the US uh, on those discussions. And I also think uh, very clearly in the context of um, the forthcoming joint declaration as well, EU NATO joint declaration, uh, that such areas will uh, also be underlined as important for both organizations. And as I said, with the campus, uh, there will be now uh, an opportunity to develop in a bit more detail uh, Europe's strategic thinking um, on security, defence and space, which is also a new avenue. And in that context as well, we have to, uh, let's say, tackle these uh, very, very difficult questions. But to be very blunt, and I'll end on this, you will never uh, get around the problem of industrial competitiveness. I mean, uh, this is really at the core of it. Uh, either as Europeans we take a decision to say we give up on our industry, which I don't think anyone wants, um, uh, uh, or else we try to defend it as best as we can. And we, we see that in many respects, how that is unfolding, whether it comes to foreign uh, screening investment, um, even thinking, by the way, about um, uh, Horizon Europe programs and how open that should be to, to all and sundry. Um, so, you know, we, we have to have those important discussions, uh, but indeed I would uh, agree with the idea or the notion that industrial competitiveness is probably the real um, core issue here uh, when it comes to uh, strategic autonomy. Thank you. Thank you. Christy? Um, yes, uh, thank you. I will um, 
pick the two questions that were addressed to me. And first to, to Monica, a very relevant question on uh, what to expect from uh, Germany's new government. And uh, as I said, I do see in future Germany's contribution to security in our region as of critical importance. And uh, this question whether Germany will actually invest more, including militarily. So looking at uh, the coalition agreement, um, there are some positive shifts, but uh, the question is whether that's enough and uh, what will actually be implemented. Of course, what is still missing is this clear commitment to, to uh, defense spending. There is no talk about uh, the 2% commitments. Instead, uh, it's the 3% that it includes everything, and we don't know exactly how that will then be uh, put into practice. And, and clearly, the coalition agreement kind of reflects this uh, strong pacifist uh, sentiment that is uh, there in the German society. And then some German experts have been keen to make this point that read the coalition agreement as a document to the German public and, and uh, not to the international audience. Uh, and that's why it's, it's uh, very cautious on these uh, kind of harder forms of uh, power. Uh, in the German like, community of security experts, I think this is a very well recognized uh, challenge. And the need for Germany to do more is, is uh, very well known and, and uh, also known in quite exact terms what, uh, what should be done in terms of developing. Uh, capabilities, etc. But um, so, what are the kind of more positive shifts? Um, well, there is a very strong focus on the EU that was to be expected, but at the same time also on the transatlantic uh, relationship. I think it's it's uh, clearly important, and there is a critical tone to Russia and China, which is a shift. But uh, there, my question mark is then. Okay, uh, we can have the political position, especially by the Greens, uh, being more critical vis-à-vis -vis Russia and China, but is it backed up by harder forms of power if needed? And Russia and China are, of course, a bit different types of uh, challenge here. Uh, with China, it's more about economic uh, measures and readiness to pay the economic costs that comes with kind of restricting uh, the Chinese political influence that comes with the economic uh, presence. And we heard about uh, some positive, positive measures taken by the EU. With Russia, it's, it's uh, more about military defense and deterrence. So if you say that you want to uh, defend our values vis-a-vis -vis Russia and take a strong value-based position, I think you also need to have actually the, the force to really defend the values if uh, need be. And, and there, I, I don't see the... Um, uh, kind of clear enough commitments. But of course, also a positive sign was that there was a specific reference to the Central and Eastern European partners and kind of willingness to um, take into account uh, their concerns. And then the other question is, is um, on, on uh, Russia and the threat perception, how, how it is expressed in the strategic compass draft. And indeed, it is puzzling perhaps not so surprising looking at the, how difficult it has been for the EU in the past years to take a more clear stance on, on Russia. The EU just does not have a strategy on Russia and it is not able to agree on, on something that could resemble a strategy because the member states are still kind of divided between those who, who see um, the current situation in terms of very fundamental disagreements between the EU and Russia or the Western Russia when it comes to the European security order and when it comes to Ukraine's position in particular, but also the more broad principles and of course also the value, um, um, value questions that are really dividing more and more uh, the EU and Russia. So from the Baltic point of view, these are fundamental sources of tension that cannot be resolved anytime soon, not under the current Russian regime. So 
we should really kind of talk about how to uh, ensure defense and deterrence and how to manage the tensions with Russia. But then we seem to have still member states who see the current situation more in temporary terms or thinking of the freeze as something that uh, will uh, pass and then we can get back to a more normal uh, relationship. So I think that's probably reflected in the, in the document. Um, I think I will stop there. Time is running. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Charles? Elspeth, I'm sorry, I've been having trouble with my audio and I didn't uh, catch the question. Would you mind repeating it or summarizing it for me? Uh, if, if you may comment uh, the uh, question about uh, Germany, you know, to what, uh, to what extent, uh, what change uh, you, do you think will come with new uh, German um, government in terms of Germany position on uh, common security and foreign policy? So, uh, and sure. maybe, maybe that would be uh, the main question for you. And what Thank type you. of crisis manager the EU should be in your perspective? That's a bridge too far, frankly. Um, <laughs> as far as Germany is concerned, um, I think we're going to see more continuity than we had perhaps originally expected, as has just been, I think, implied to some extent because of the um, domestic constraints in Germany. Um, I think one of the interesting things to observe, to follow in the next few weeks and months is how the, obviously, the Macron, the, or the, the election in France will, will be crucial here as well, but how, what's going to happen to the Franco-German tandem, the Franco-German relationship in months and years to come? Um, and of course, this impacts very directly on the conceptual and specific development of uh, strategic autonomy. Um, the interesting thing, I think, is that uh, Germany has been very ambivalent. Uh, obviously, Germany is, is, is not the biggest fan of strategic autonomy, um, and that, I think, will, be, will continue to be the case under the next German government. And it's also interesting that, you know, governments like the Spanish one, um, in spite of Spain's overwhelmingly uh, enthusiastic support for closer European integration, um, actually feels more comfortable with the German position than with the French one, contrary to what one might otherwise believe. Um, I, for one, am not actually terribly worried about Franco-German uh, disagreements. I think, in a sense, the Franco-German disagreement is what guarantees that there is an element of pluralism uh, in in the EU, that we are um, that we will remain dis despite our different sizes and the sizes of our economies and sizes of our defence budgets and so on. Um, I think that we will remain a very plural European Union. I know that a lot of people only see this in terms of uh, the, the the weakness that this may result in, but um, I, I would like to stress that this Franco-German diversity, the fact that they are not necessarily always on the same page, that there isn't a unanimous view of the future of European integration, and in particular of the future of European security and defence, is actually quite a positive thing overall. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you, Stina? Thanks a lot. Uh, very, very briefly about this Belt and Road Initiative and my perception about this effectiveness. I think that, generally speaking, effectiveness is very low. And of course, we can talk about uh, specific countries where China is pretty active, but I think that there is, uh, generally speaking, the global backlash against the BLT Road Initiative and the standards that China is offering. And your question, if EU should uh, prepare um, a strategy against or as a response to the Belt and Road Initiative, be bearing in mind that Belt and Road Initiative is, to some extent, a failure, I think, yes, EU should uh, prepare it because it's for some standard setting and some norms that EU should promote and to be more attractive comparing to the China. China, China is becoming more inward looking right now, so I do not expect that China will be very active in it, in this kind of belt, in, investment under the Belt and Road Initiative. But um, I think that it's a very good idea to prepare something to, to be more attractive than Chinese offer in the EU. Thank you, Stina. Um, I do not see uh, other questions, so now I will give um, a time, one, two minutes to each of panelists to have final words. 
personally, I'm interested if uh, the EU can do anything about the basic problem, meaning how to build the common perception of threats in the EU and build a strategic culture, because this is a problem. And uh, we, we usually ask EU to prioritize, and now I would like to ask my panelists to prioritize and please pick up one issue, issue what the EU can do to, uh, to, uh, to have more effective actions uh, in foreign and security field. One issue. So uh, let's start maybe uh, with the same order, Daniel. Thank you. Yes, let me let me maybe give you the the, the boring uh, answer uh, to your question, which is a good question, which is that uh, if um, if the member states uh, firstly endorse the campus in March 2022, that will be a first very good step. Uh, but second of all, uh, if they implement all all of the deliverables in the campus, uh, we would have already moved significantly uh, forward. I would say in the next few years. Uh, so that's what they should do, deliver on what they sign up to. I think that's a, a core uh, feature of this. And then I think also in relation to your point about strategic culture, that doesn't happen overnight. Huh? Uh, but this is one step in that direction, uh, the question of strategic solidarity based on the types of events that we face very close to our borders and even further afield. Uh, this will continue to catalyze um, uh, and stimulate the interest of EU member states in what the EU can do for them uh, and what they indeed can do for EU defense. So, uh, very basic answer, deliver on the compass, agree to the compass, and I will be a very happy man. <laughs> Thanks. Christy? Um, thank you. I would actually continue on the issue of Russia because it's so important for my country and, and for also for Poland. So one more point on Russia. Actually, what we have seen in the past years is that Russia tends to underestimate the EU. Of course, it's a very asymmetric relationship uh, with Russia and the EU having very different types of resources. But one of the problems on the EU side is that the EU kind of seems to be able to get its act together when it is really pushed hard by Russia and to be more united than anyone would expect and, and be ready to, for example, impose sanctions and to, to show solidarity with uh, Poland and Lithuania now with the, with the hybrid attacks. So what the EU should try to develop is this more... <sighs> clarity in, in signaling to Russia that we are actually able to respond to your hybrid methods of influence. We work hand in hand with NATO, which provides the military aspects. The EU also has its political unity when, when we are really undermined and pushed. Uh, we are able to, to respond with uh, some unified uh, measures uh, that uh, put limits on, on uh, malicious actions, be it from Russia or, or elsewhere. Thank you. Charles? Thank you very much. Um, most of you have been stressing, quite rightly, of course, that we are very diverse, that we have very different threat perceptions. This is, of course, true. And as Daniel was uh, suggesting, this is not going to change overnight. You know, after all, our motto is united in diversity out of the many one, if you like. But let's also keep in mind that this is not incompatible with very fundamental forms of solidarity within, within the EU and, and within NATO, of course. Um, in other words, although Spaniards, for example, obviously perceive the southern neighborhood uh, with far more interest and concern than they do the eastern neighborhood, um, you know, there are Spanish F-18s um, in the Baltic um, air policing missions, uh, in NATO's policing missions. Um, and you know, nobody has ever questioned that. So what I'm saying is that uh, we do have a very diverse Europe, but we are capable of fundamental uh, solidarity between member states. What I would recommend is that we use the debate generated by the compass, which obviously is a rather technical debate, which will mainly interest experts and not society at large, but, but we should find ways of using uh, the EU debate about the strategic compass um, about the compass to basically uh, encourage our citizens um, to 
um, become more aware of some of the challenges that we are facing, both regards to China, and that, of course, is something that most of our citizens can now relate to more clearly than they did in the past, but also, of course, with regard to Russia. And I've been fascinated to see uh, the enormous amount of media attention that's been given to um, the, the uh, crisis in on the Polish-Belarus uh, border. And let me take this opportunity, by the way, to express my fullest uh, solidarity with Poland, uh, with the people and the government of Poland in this context. So I think we need to realize that um, if strategic autonomy is going to be taken seriously by our voters, our citizens, um, we need greater domestic ownership. And I think we're not doing enough uh, with regard to that. Thank you. Thank you, Stina. So my, my role is to talk about China. So um, first of all, if we're talking about some recommendations. So first of all, establish, we should establish the, the, um, those me defensive measures that are now in progress, that they're under the preparation. Then identify loopholes uh, in those uh, that uh, are operational and try to fix them. We should focus when it comes to China mostly on technology and cyber issues. Also to monitor and be vigilant about China-Russia cooperation, especially uh, right now. And also the last, uh, the last recommendation, we should, we should look what is going on inside China domestically, because there is a huge, um, I think that China is under huge pressure domestically, and this is the reason why China is becoming more aggressive externally. Thank you. Thank you, Justyna. Uh, as a final word, word uh, from uh, Etcher, I would only say that the EU way of building strategic autonomy is uh, full of uh, rocks. Uh, we have to start at home, obviously, but I should remind you um, what was written in the European Global Strategy in 2016, uh, that EU neighbors' weaknesses are EU weaknesses. And with this word, I would like to close the panel session and please join me in thanking our panelists for great performance.